So, I'm happy to introduce our next uh, speaker, and uh, thanks for staying from our cloud security discussion. Um, Lenny Zeltzer, he is an incident response handler at the Internet Storm Center, so that ex you know exposes him to a number of different exploits and threats and attacks that are on the net today. He's an instructor uh, at SANS and leads courses on malicious software, you know, identifying and, and remediating. And his daytime job is a uh, leads the consulting team, the professional services team at Savis. So uh, without further ado, Lenny. All right, hi everybody. Oh, thank you. All right, we're, we're done. I remember um, I was one social engineer to come and watch a play uh, because they, they posted all these posters around town and it said, um, come see this play, it's gonna be really good, it's called Hotel Paradise. And so we figured nothing to do this weekend, so we came into a show and it was a small show and, it, and in the very beginning they said, you know what, we got you in here and you thought you're gonna see a hotel, a show called Hotel Paradise, but in reality it's gonna be a totally different show and we're calling it Hotel um, and then the F word, and uh, and I, so that was very interesting. It wasn't a very good play because I felt like they tricked me into being there, and I have no idea why they were doing that. So I hope I didn't trick you into being in the session. I want to talk about uh, social engineering attacks that that work and that have worked and that have worked, because it's really an attack vector that is very effective. And and those of you who perform penetration testing can probably vouch for the fact that whenever social engineering is in scope of your test, you're usually successful. And uh, it comes to the point where sometimes I advise my clients to not even bother, just assume that it's successful and let's talk about what happens next. Uh, so uh, we know that social engineering works and it works because social engineers are really good at influencing their victims to take the action that the social engineer wants them to take. And because it's so effective, uh, I thought, well, what can we do to uh, get better at the uh, well, withstanding such attacks. And uh, oftentimes people talk about social engineering in the context of penetration testing. And I wanted to stay away from that because it's easy to, to, it's easy to disregard any advice that's based on the very controlled social engineering scenarios of penetration testing. For example, you may have heard of the various, uh, of an experiment where researchers asked people for their password by giving out candy and pens. And they said, wow, look at this, everybody gave up their password because we were promised to give them candy. Well, that's a very staged experiment, and we don't really know if the password that the researchers got were real passwords. So I thought, all right, let me survey the real world uh, to see what attacks have been disclosed publicly that had an element of social engineering. And we don't have a lot of time to go very deep into any of those attacks, so instead I'm going to survey this landscape at a very uh, high level. And what I want to do is I look at these incidents, many of them you probably have heard of, but maybe you haven't had a chance to look at all of them in one session. Because I want to see what patterns can we derive, can we somehow categorize these various social engineering techniques so that it's easier for us to talk to our users uh, about social engineering threats and so that it's easier for us to look at our defenses. Because here's my premise. There's often a debate about what's more prevalent and more dangerous. Is it the outsider threat or is it the insider threat? And when it comes, once you accept the success of social engineering, I think you will recognize that there is really no di distinction anymore. If you have an outsider, if they use a social engineering technique, well, then they become an insider. So really, maybe it's not even worth arguing whether insider or outsider thread is more important to us. Uh, I've been thinking more and more that insider is just like an outsider, outsider is just like an insider, because it takes very little effort for an outsider to become an insider and have access to a lot of information. So I want to survey a bunch of incidents uh, that some of them you've probably heard about. I want to look for patterns. I want to try to categorize them. And this way we can learn something about real world social engineering attacks and become better at defending against them. And the first category of attacks that I want to talk about are those that really 
make use of alternative channel of communications. And maybe it's too fancy of a, of a phrase, alternative channel of communications. What does that mean? Well, it means that attackers find that their victims are most susceptible, susceptible to influence when the attacker engages them on a, using a different medium than the victim is used to. Uh, for example, the first time I really saw how, how effective this is, is where some windshield windshields uh, were pasted with a flyer that said, hey, you parked improperly. To see more information about this, please go to this website. And you may have seen this. Uh, I think I reported on it about a, a year and a half ago. So these were the flyers that were pasted on the windshields of cars parked, I think, in South Dakota. And it says, go to horribleparking.com to see more information. Now, if you got a spam message that said, your vehicle was parked improperly, please go to horribleparking.com, you probably would have disregarded it as spam, uh, and so would a lot of people. But when people got this notice in the physical world, outside of the normal channel of communication that they're used to being on guard uh, in, well, a lot of them went to horribleparking.com, and, and they saw some pictures of improperly parked cars in their, in their very own town. And of course, if they wanted to see the picture of their own vehicle parked improperly, Properly. Well, guess what? They had to download this media player. And if they downloaded it, then they infected themselves with a fake antivirus tool. So that was just one example that, that to me really emphasized how vulnerable we are when the attacker's message comes to us in a channel that's uh, alternate from uh, what we're used to seeing and protecting ourselves against. So email, we're all used to being on guard about our email. So here's an attack that begins in the physical world. Here's another example. Again, a variation of a phishing scam, but because people are used to recognizing phishing scams that come to them over email, in this case, there was a, a phone-based element to it. And these are not new. They have been spreading for, for a number of years. At some point, People used to call them vishing, but that kind of went out of uh, favor. Now it's just an element of phishing scams, but this one begins with a voice message that arrives into the victim's phone mailbox. And it's a recorded message. It says something like, uh, we wanted to welcome you to our bank. Please call us at this number to confirm that your account is set up properly. Uh, Another variation of many such messages is, is a message that says that uh, we think there's been fraudulent activity in your account and uh, you need to call us. And when you call, you get a message that says that your card has been suspended and please click one or press one to go to our security department and to talk to them. What's going on here is that, again, the attackers are making use of an alternative channel of communication because people tend to trust phone com communications a bit more than they trust their email communications. So again, a scam that has been very effective. We uh, at the Internet Storm Center looked at one server that had uh, web files that had these recordings on them. So these are just web files where the, where the attacker recorded the real bank's uh, voice system. And then whenever somebody calls the attacker's probably voice over IP number, well, they play these WAV, WAV files, and it sounds just like the real thing. And there are toolkits that allow attackers to automate these attacks. It becomes really easy to do because, well, it's easy on the black market to come by hacked uh, Skype accounts that allow you to call people in the real world and to accept messages from people that call you. Just like nowadays, it's probably not too difficult to hire somebody to start handing out flyers, inviting people in a particular town to visit your malicious website. And how expensive would that be? There's plenty of people, plenty of students who are willing to do that at, I don't know, nine bucks per hour probably. So here's another example. Again, this is something that has been really effective over the last year, and that's the use of USB keys as an infection vector. And uh, Many of us have probably heard of a very effective penetration testing technique that involves the pen tester placing their uh, backdoor program on a USB key and then just leaving these USB keys around in the lunchroom of the company that they're target, trying to target. And people are going to find the USB key and they're going to insert it into their computer because, hey, it's a freebie. Who can? I mean, it's great to have more storage because, God forbid, we run out of storage. But I, I wanted to stay away from, from pen testing. So here's a real world example where spreading through USB keys has been really effective. And this is an example of a config of worm. And some of you maybe had the misfortune of having to deal with these infections uh, last year in your organizations. Config of worm, yes, it used the USB key as an infection vector because, again, people are used to being more trusting of USB keys 
we were very um, afraid of floppy drives. Remember how you, you made sure to scan a floppy drive when you used it because maybe it has a, a boot sector virus? Well, floppies went away. People forgot about that infection vector. So we're back to the modern version of floppy drives is USB keys. So here's one interesting element of social engineering.